Hi everyone, welcome to the Res Dog Walkers, brought to you by the Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference. I'm your host, Dallas Smith. I'm here to talk about the benefits of First Nations, resource developers, and government working together in BC and across Canada. This podcast has been launched alongside the BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference, happening April 24th to 26th, 2024 in Nanaimo, BC. Save the date and visit our website at www.bciroc.ca to learn more. So I've got a very special guest. I have my good friend, Isaiah Robinson. He's the Deputy Chief Counselor of Kitasu Hehe Nation and General Manager of the Kitasu Development Corporation. We're going to be shooting from the hip and talking about a couple issues that matter to us. So let's dive into it. Good morning, Isaiah. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Dallas. So, as you know, Res Dog Walkers came from a conference you and I attended in June last year in Vancouver, where I believe it was yourself, myself, Chief Chris Roberts, and um, and another guest who were on a panel talking about the importance of a fair transition process around aquaculture in BC. And I noticed that one of the one of the opponents of the industries that our nations are supporting and that are helping our nations find own source revenue, self-determination, blah, 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 all that important stuff, said that we should be replacing these, you know, eighty dollars to $90,000 a year family supporting breadwinning. I believe that's a term that you use as each house needs a breadwinner. Um, one of the people said that our people should resort to dog walking as a way of fulfilling the economic needs of our communities. And anyone who's ever been on a res, walking a dog on a res is a whole different beast. And so ever since that day, I started thinking, you know, we need a chance to sit down and have the real discussion. It's one thing to sit in a conference and have your slideshow and shoot off the cuff a little bit. But I think it's important that people who are around First Nations and interested in developing resources and managing resources and protecting resources need to hear the real conversation that needs to happen. So I'm really, really pleased to have you here today. Um, where do we find you today? I'm currently on the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people in Ottawa, uh, participating in the AFN uh, this week. So you've been out there since I left you last week when you and I were talking to many le- many members of cabinet, the opposition, different different levels of government. Um, how did you feel our discussions around aquaculture transition went last week? I think there was good good dialogue, uh, good discussions, I think, uh, at, at all levels. Um, I definitely think we had good traction primarily in certain Pacific Caucus areas, I think, and that really were, I'm hopeful in, in my perspective, they're actually getting our voices heard in that regard. It, it's interesting watching this develop and, you know, you and I have been sort of leading the charge on supporting nations who are supportive of the aquaculture sector in their territories. You know, we've watched for the last half dozen years where nations who haven't wanted this opportunity in their territory have transitioned it out. But at the same time, that's sort of set the plate for other people to assume that because some nations don't want it, other nations shouldn't have it. And I seem to notice that it's not really just about aquaculture. We seem to seem to be in this place in the world where either you protect resources or you develop resources. And, you know, from your experience, where where do you stand on just that whole one or the other? Or do you think that's as garbage as I do? I'm on the same page. I think I look for balance. Uh, you know, obviously, Kitasu has protected a lot of our territory in regards to the Great Bear Order. And um, however, we've been very progressive when it comes to industry in regards to development, in regards to developing strong partnerships with industry. Um, and so I think we're at a really interesting time in regards to reconciliation in Canada, in regards to working with industry in general. And I think, our, you know, I, with our partners, I think we're at a point of a good example of what other industries could be actually doing within uh, the other the, where they operate in these other indigenous territories. 
That, that's great. I mean, it's funny because I live in this world where I just assume everybody knows what's going on in my head. So I just start talking about a topic like everybody's, you know, as in depth into it as I am or who my guest of the day may be. But why don't you just give me a little, you know, give me, give me the two minute version of, of Kittisu's introduction into the aquaculture industry from where you started. Well, I guess you weren't even there, I guess. <laughs> no, I wasn't even born, born when it started, but um, you know, let me know where Kidisu started and where you and I have picked up the fight today. Yeah, so it, for us, it really starts in the '60s when we lost the overall commercial industry, uh, and, and a lot of the indigenous coastal communities relied on that. Uh, and so we lost that in the late '60s. We struggled to have jobs, struggled with social issues like every other indigenous community. And our, our leaders at the time said, enough is enough. We need a red winner in every household. How can we do that? And it was actually quite interesting hearing the history a little bit earlier in the last couple of weeks. And it's, it came to light that it was actually the government at the time that actually said, here's aquaculture. Take a look at it. See what you, want, what you can do with it. And so 1988, we started our own salmon farms. And 1990, 1998, we actually first signed the first overall agreement with industry. Um, first of its kind. And uh, we've been in partnership for the last 20 years, basically. So, you know, we, then within the last two years, Dallas and I have became colleagues and good friends in this chaos we li we're living in with right now in regards to transition. And, you know, it's really, it's really important, actually, in my perspective, that we're actually having these dialogues with these other partners, these other Indigenous communities, because Never in my perspective was this ever, ever going to happen. But I'm really, as odd as, as odd as it may be, I'm actually quite thankful that all 17 of us are actually working together to actually work with industry and to work with the government. It's quite a unique perspective and a unique situation we're in. I mean, you're so, you're so right. I, I remember when John Paul Fraser first came to me and said, hey, you know, there's 17 different First Nations who have impact benefit agreements with our industry. Why don't you try to get see if they'll all work together and we can kind of work towards a better tomorrow and talk about a lot of the concerns that the opponents of aquaculture have. And I kind of like, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> but then we had our first meeting and, you know, you you and Chris McKnight showed up and the yeah, Housit showed up and Aguaslanaquara showed up, Quatino showed up. And we realized that we had a fair a fair makeup of First Nations communities that understood the importance of this sector. And it was really interesting watching the process develop. You know, when we had our first press conference, I had to invite a bunch of mayors and local politicians to stand on the stage with me because we couldn't get any First Nations leaders to stand with us because they're afraid of the blowback. And that's the interesting thing about this dialogue is the romanticism around wild Pacific salmon has sort of taken the common sense out of this discussion. I mean, as you know, and as I'm sure is the same with your community, wild salmon has sustained the communities I come from for 14,000 years, and it wouldn't ever be in a position where it's one or the other. I mean, my own history in this industry has jumped back and forth a few times. As you know, I led sort of part of the charge in the Great Bear Rainforest and aquaculture was a very contentious issue in the mid 90s and late 90s. And I jumped back and forth a few times between whether I supported it, whether I didn't. But leadership in some of the communities around me started signing agreements and making me aware of some of the opportunities that came. Because just like you said, as the fishing industry started to decline in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, we still had people who clung on to this as a sole employment opportunity. And I watched the social distress that happened just in my own family with the depletion of the commercial fishing industry. And it opened my eyes a little bit to just, holy, there's something that has to change here. And so... It's part of the, I guess, epic saga, if you will, around the coast of British Columbia. We seem to become, you know, force fed these opportunities around forestry, around aquaculture. And then people from urban settings want to tell us how it can and can't work. And I've gained frustration with that over the years because like your nation, you know, I've worked with nations who've helped protect 33% of the coast through the Great Bear Rainforest Land Use Act. We've been part of the marine planning exercises that have launched the Marine Protected Areas Strategy. And so for us to be able to go forward and find that, 
balance between economic well-being, ecological well-being, and human human well-being in our communities is something that takes a lot of work and a lot of real dialogue. And that's one of the things I'm hoping this podcast is going to start to shed some light on is what are the real discussions that are happening around this? I mean, the dollars and cents are important, but if the dollars and cents aren't going into something that leads to something better and stronger, why are we wasting our time? And I look at the work that your community is doing around stewardship. You guys have been a leader, a global leader in stewardship initiatives, but I imagine you must have to invest some own source revenue on that. Well, no, that's exactly it. There's tons of initiatives that we do across the board. There's tons of science projects that my colleague in stewardship is doing. And so there's a lot of finding and starting to su- finding people to actually try to support us to do this. And this is what, you know, the, the current chief counselor has done a phenomenal job is to try to find funders to help us battle the government of Canada in, in multiple avenues to close fisheries, to, to have better dialogue and to have candid discussions about science that and that's how we operate in, in Kittisu is science is, is key to making all good decisions in the end. Science is interesting. I'm, I'm glad you brought science up because that's really been part of the challenge of this whole aquaculture debate is what is good science and what isn't science. I can't tell you how much it frustrates me as I mean, you and I have been to Ottawa five, six times in the last two years around this issue. And it's amazing how the activist has convinced the government of Canada that their science isn't adequate for this discussion. But yet, we use the same scientific protocol, we use the same CSAS process to help determine scientific methodology for every other decision we make in Canada. But for some reason in aquaculture, it's not there. So it's nice to hear that you guys have done your own science and you're working in collaboration with others. I know we're working on an initiative out of Campbell River called the Indigenous Centre for Aquatic Health Science because our chiefs got simply confused. We got told that industry science was tainted towards industry. We got told that government science was unreliable. We've seen activist science play out in front of our eyes from people like Alexander Morton and others who aren't even, you know, accredited biologists. And we've gotten caught in the middle of this. And so one of the things the local chiefs in the nations that I work for have said, why don't you build us the capacity to do our own science? But let's take it a step further. Let's not only have Western science as a background and a foundation for what we're doing, but let's incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into this. And I imagine that's something that you guys have been doing for years because you're not close to really anything. (laughs) So you're kind of on your own up there. And how do you guys continue to just find that way of finding what's best for your community by working with both the environmental community, but also your industry partners to make your community a better place to live? Well, that's a good question that we're, we're, you know, when it comes down to balance and it comes down to certain perspectives that I think it's, it's obviously a challenging, right? And I, when it comes down to having these discussions of science and what our expectations are, it's really my expectation is, is similar to yours is what we say is what industry and what environmental groups should respect. I think, you know, what, what was created from the Great Bear Order was, in my perspective, a phenomenal setup of how partnerships and, and relationships should move forward. However, I think that that reminder has definitely changed, I think, of how successful that was, right? And I think at this point, um, the activists have a, a way better when it comes to how uh, we what now what we're having to deal with now, right? You know, before, you know, my colleague Percy Starr, my chief counselor at the time, just told them to you know where to go basically and uh, now we don't really have that option uh, so it's it's a really interesting situation when it comes to working with industry you know they're very much willing to do whatever the nation says uh, and NGOs obviously we have there, there's always further discussions and stuff like that but in my perspective what we say goes in our territory nice and and that's the way it should be I know we we've learned a lot kind of from each other over the years but our nations we have this line of communication between us now that didn't exist and i think it makes us a little bit more i think it keeps you know it keeps us from reacting as much as we used to and you made a good point about activists i mean i I spent 20 years in the great bear rainforest and i really appreciate the role of activists in bringing attention to a problem that exists in british columbia 
But I also note that they haven't really been part of the solution. They, they help bring awareness to an issue, but it wasn't until our nations pulled ourselves together, started doing our own spatial planning, both marine and terrestrial, and started taking this discussion to government. I mean, obviously there's other things in the background that supplement that discussion. I mean, we got Delgamook, we've got Taku River Klingit, we've got Haida One, Haida Two. So we've got these other court cases and litigation that have helped bring government to the table to have a discussion, but it's really been up to the First Nations to put something together to put in front of government, so we're not always reacting. I think that's one, been one of the reasons why I'm still involved at the nation level is we're so much more proactive now. You know, in the early days at the LRMP table, before it was named the Great Bear Rainforest by the environmentalists, you know, my only mandate was to sit there and listen and defend our rights and title. It wasn't to talk about our economic aspirations. It wasn't to talk about our protection aspirations. It was basically just to go there and tell people, you should be able to do that without us. And for a couple of years, it was fun because, you know, you got to know the different stakeholder groups that were working in your territories. But then as these court cases going, we started growing with our ambition on what we wanted to achieve. And I look at, again, what your nation's done. I mean, you guys have announced, is it two IPCAs in your territory, Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas? Or is it one that has two chunks to it? I think it's just one, and then that's the Kittisu Bay. And that's the Kittisu Bay territory, if I, if I recall yeah. correctly. We announced that last June, I believe. And that's one of our... our it's protecting our overall breadbasket is what we call it. It's, it's where the herring spawn. It's where you find tons of large halibut. It's perfect. It's perfect for our community. And we want that to be managed and operated only by us. And that's really, uh, we're, we're quite proud of that overall initiative. Well, and, I mean, not only have you guys done that, I've, I've been in awe a little bit. And I mean, in a big room, I wouldn't admit it, but this is a podcast between you and I. I don't know how many people are going to listen to this, but, you know, to watch Kittisu lead the way and then have New Hawk follow with the jurisdiction powers that your guardians have now achieved. You know, the yes. work that's been done on the, on the sustainability side is so huge. But again, we go back to this fundamental question is, is it all or one? Is it, is it one or the other? And I think, you know, nations like yours, um, you know, the nations that I work for in Numbacol's Council, I look at the work that the Ahousit's doing around not only protecting their territories, but creating economic opportunity to help deal with some of the social issues. Um, I think we're showing the world that we're, we're more than apt to take care of our, of our future and self-determination. Um, what, what is your, what is your interest in, you know, where, where do you see this aquaculture discussion going forward from here? We've got this four phase transition process that DFO is going through that we've sort of yeah. been complaining about the whole time. But at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. you and I and the other 15 nations that we've been working with have started to build a bit of a transition plan. Um, and so where mm -hmm. do you see your nation going in the next couple of years with this discussion? I have high hopes. Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you do too in regards to how we can continue growing and flourishing. You know, that's really what I see as the general manager of the development corporation. I, I see further opportunity uh, for aquaculture within our territory. Obviously, you know, the, the overall uh, fisheries resource reconciliation agreement is another opportunity that that's a large agreement that in regards to fishing, right? And so economics across the board uh, is really the goal. But obviously, there's you know, we, we talk about, it's, it's, it's a difficult balance when it comes to in community too. Nothing is ever going to be, and not, not everyone is going to be on side or have agreement. So it's always that interesting balance and dialogue that we have to have. How can we move forward together? Because this industry, um, the overall aquaculture industry is massive within my community. And so we can't simply just say adios. Uh, you know, we have to fight. And that's really what it's coming down to. And we, this is such an integral part. and. From here on, I still see it growing, but obviously too, we're at 99% employment rate. So it's how do we balance that? If we bring more aquaculture in, who are we bringing in to work for us? How is that going to work? So it's a really interesting situation of, of being in a sandbox, basically, and how we can continue growing this industry, but in what context and how far can we go with it? Well, I, I think you brought up a great point there, and we realize there's a certain symbiosis between all of our nations involved in this industry because as we saw the the unlawful shutdown of 
19 farms in the Discovery Islands, all of our nations involved in this industry started to feel the ripple effect because processing plants had to change their hours and capacity issues. And um, I understand that Aquatrans is BC Ferry's second largest client because of the aquaculture industry in, in promoting, in sorry, in delivering fresh fresh fish to be delivered around the world. And ironically, I, I also found out that right now Canada's importing a majority of its salmon from Norway, Chile, and Scotland right now, where we were happily growing that in our waters for years up until this last couple of years where kind of the whole, the whole cart got tipped upside down. Um, but it's interesting to see the role of industry in this. We keep talking about transition. DFO sort of came to us and said, we got to do transition. And we're like, well, what, what are you transitioning from? From what to what? Because under our watch, this industry has started to transition, if you will, for the last half a dozen years. Um, I know the relationships that I've had with my partners in Greek Seafoods and the Cloud Seas Nation, we've started sort of similar to you saying, okay, well, if you're going to operate in our territory, here's are the rules, here's the guidelines, and here's the expectations. If you want to agree to a long-term process based on these principles, Let's talk about transition. Let's talk about growth. Let's talk about how this can work. But I know one of the other things that nations are doing now is they're actually leveraging some of these partnerships into helping restore wild salmon. I know the initiative that we're working on is we're looking at cryogenically freezing some brood stock from some of our endangered rivers. So as we work with forest companies and other resource developers, we can do some of the some of the repairing of some of the watersheds that have been damaged through past poor logging practices and global warming and climate change and some of those sorts of things. And so now I'm really excited to have the fact that I have people that grow fish for a living, helping me in my endeavor to bring wild salmon populations back to my community. But you know, if you read the Globe and Mail or if you read, you know, the local newspapers, the Times Colonist, no one realizes that we're having all these side discussions that supplement this overall discussion. So um, it's, it's interesting times for sure. So I think I'm going to do a bit of a, a bit of a change the wheel here a little bit. Um, in football analogy, they'd call it an audible. But I think we're going to bring Dave Kimmel in. Um, the managing director of CERMAC Canada, and let's just put him on the spot and see if he's willing to answer a few of our questions and have a little bit of a dialogue with us. Welcome to the show, Dave. So yeah, thanks for coming on, Dave. Um, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other quite a bit over the last four or five years. Um, you know, we, we've sort of sat together as we've watched your industry really take some serious gut shots. Um, you know, we watched Minister Bernadette Jordan shut down 19 fish farms in the Discovery Islands and we found out through the media. Um, you know, you, you, you called me up after that happened and asked me to work with you and your company and see if we could facilitate an arrangement and a negotiation with the We Become Nation. And, you know, you and I sat down and I, I, I believe we called the project Catch Up Ketchup, ketchup popsicles. Ketchup popsicles was the code name for our project because, well, it's just funny. It was from a Chris Farley movie, and you know the chief, Chief Chris Roberts and I are dear friends, and we all seem to like really dumb movies. So ketchup popsicles seemed to be an adequate title for the initiative that we undertook. And so we sat down and we got community support for the reintroduction of two sites out of the nineteen that were shut down. And, um, well, I guess I don't need to tell the story. Why don't you tell me why, first, why your company decided to try engage Indigenous communities and what kind of process did we get into? Yeah, thanks, Dallas. I, I guess if I just take a step back and <clears throat> just, you know, I work with a group of people that, uh, you know, a lot of them have been around in the industry for, for quite some time in British Columbia. And, you know, they've been around long enough to understand that, you know, Unfortunately, you know, let's be honest, if things had happened differently in the past, things would probably look different now than they do, but it doesn't mean the future can still look the same. Um, one of our colleagues obviously helped put the first farms in in 
Councillor uh, Isaiah's territory uh, 25 years ago, and I've had the pleasure of working with that woman who's inspired me to carry on the work with her while she still works for the business. So why it is we're doing what we're doing? Well, first and foremost, we see that clearly, without a doubt, black and white as can be, that that is the pathway forward to stability for our business and, in my opinion, the industry in British Columbia. Uh, in that is an immense opportunity um, to give back, quite frankly, and deliver shared value in its true form. Um, I, I just see it as the rightful place to be uh, operating in. You know, as you said, we we operate we operate in a shared resource. Um, we understand that uh, you know there's it's it's an emotional subject at this point in time. A lot of snap and quick decisions are being made that don't represent the hours and the days and the weeks and the months and the years of work that have, have gone into it. And, and some have delivered successes and others have delivered n not so great things. And that's OK, too. Um, CERMAC has tried processes and been through processes and in certain areas where the outcome has been we leave. And we've signed up for that and we're OK with that. Um, what we're asking for now, and as you've talked about here briefly today, the uh, Discovery Islands or the opportunity to reintroduce into the DI is an opportunity to uh, work together with like-minded nations to see if we can build a future together. Um, you know, I, I represent the company, but I also have a boss. Um, he lives in Norway and our company is owned by Mitsubishi. And I can speak with great confidence that our approach here in British Columbia is supported top to bottom. Uh, in the organization, which again is important that there's that unified voice within to ensure a unified message and approach is taken by the organization and its representatives when dealing with these tough conversations, whether it be with indigenous communities or different members of provincial or, or federal government. You know, it, it's interesting that, that, you know, you put it that way because, you know, we worked very hard. We got nation support. We got full unanimous council support for the reintroduction of the two sites. We worked with every level of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans where we even had the deputy minister sign off on the recommendation only to be completely ignored by the minister's office. And Isaiah and I were talking about this earlier in the day where it's so frustrating that you follow all the rules that are put in front of you and then you even follow the rules that have been added by First Nations communities. But yet we still, still seem to be fighting this mysterious monster from urban areas, you know, whether it be from Vancouver or Victoria, they seem to have the loudest voice when it seems to be coming down to what's happening in our territories. And, you know, I've been fortunate enough, I've, I've, I've been around a bit now, you know, and I, I've stood beside premiers and prime ministers as they wax on poetically about self-determination and economic re reconciliation and all those sort of really cool catchwords. But the moment something becomes politically unpopular, that all seems to get thrown out the window. And so, you know, where do we go with this? And I understand that the activists have been successful in dredging up old stories that have seeming to started to take some place in the media over the last little while. How do you as a company deal with that? I mean, I'm, I'm sort of asking you as a company, but I'm also asking you as someone who I've spent a lot of time with and grown some respect for and how you manage your business and how you manage your company. But, you know, we're, we're fighting these unnamed battles, these unnamed enemies. And I just want to know how you deal with that. Yeah, I guess first and foremost, you know, you have to have the relationships that matter to begin with. And, and so whenever we do bring any information forward, we understand that it's supported and understood by our uh, Indigenous partners that we work with. That's step one, uh, because without that, you can't move forward with confidence. Step two for us as a business, who is receiving the message uh, and what are you replying to? I think in today's day and age, everybody can attest to this. And this is not just unique to the to the salmon farming industry and industry in general. It's very, very hard to get a balanced story out there for people to sort of consume and reflect upon and then make the decisions accordingly. It's almost as if decision made, then comes the story, and then everything after that is forgotten about because it's all about what happened two days ago and you're always playing catch up. Um, and so that, you know, that's unfortunate because when that happens, whatever the subject matter may be and you know, whether it's related to, 
interactions between the operations in the environment or uh, say, uh, for example, uh, you know, market activity or what have you, plankton blooms, you name it. Um, it's very hard to find an audience right now because of the pressure on the sector that's willing to listen in a non-biased manner. Um, and that's coming from me. And, and so then I shift, okay, so if they're not, or if it's hard for someone to hear what I have to say, the next best thing, or quite frankly, the higher hanging fruit is for someone to speak on behalf of the business. And, and this is where I then reflect on, you know, our partners with the house at first nation and Hashakmas, the hereditary chief of that nation, uh, willing to speak up and talk to the importance of the relationship of the opportunities that happen because my operations are there and 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 take the conversation from quite granular and and focused on you know noise per se or old news or misinformation but more of a broader overarching message about opportunities existing because CERMAC exists and that's really where I'd like the conversation to get to as long as our sector is a political football in Canada, it is going to really struggle to not only thrive, but survive. Um, we, we can't be passed on from one party to another as an issue. And, and then I go back to my earlier comment, then, you know, I really, I have three governments in my mind that I'm responsible to report. I, re, I have three governments I'm responsible to report to, provincial, federal, and indigenous. And so if the message is carried forward by my indigenous governments that I work with two other, then it becomes a government to government discussion, correct? Mm -hmm. And it takes me out of the fray actually, and I'm supplying information when needed. And that to me is like where I'd like to get to. I think, I think we're pretty close, but for whatever reason, it's just because of a lot of different reasons. I just, it's not acceptable yet that that's the case in some circles. No, I, I think that's so true and so fair. Um, Isaiah, you know, you and I have been talking about this over the last couple of years, but you live in Clem 2. That's, you know, as as we learned many, many times last week in Ottawa, that's 800 kilometers away from Vancouver. It's a 10-hour boat ride from your community to Port Hardy, plus a four-hour drive, plus another two-hour ferry ride. You know, how do you deal with the frustrations of an urban environment telling you what you can and cannot do in your territories? And it's not even limited to aquaculture really i mean the the urban voice is trying to tell us how to manage our forestry resources and they use activist rhetoric and i mean one of the things that is just so frustrating to me is the lack of accountability in the activist community you know when we stand up Isaiah and I are accountable to our communities. We're accountable to the leadership in our communities. We're accountable to the community members. Dave, you have a board of directors. You have a boss in Norway who's got a boss in Japan. We all have to play by a certain set of rules. But for some reasons with activists, that's all out the window. And unfortunately, government seems to be listening to these guys. And so Isaiah, how do, how do you manage that? Well, just like you said previously, you know, we have respect for the activists when it comes down to certain ways and ethical properties that they do provide us. You know, they have highlighted certain opportunities for Indigenous people. However, you know, they're only really accountable to the millionaires or billionaires that are funding them in the end, that they can just go off the cuff and do whatever the hell they want, in all honesty, to cause chaos for our Indigenous communities, right? And so, you know, I have, you know, when it comes down to to us, and obviously it's hard to have these discussions because they don't really care. They're just there to do one job and to provide misinformation. But for me, balance is super critical, Dallas, and I've said this many times. I, I want balance within these communities. Yes, we do need to protect our territories, but you know, we also need to have economic well-being. That is the most critical thing, you know, and that's really what the activists aren't really doing anything for us, and even more so you know, we need to continue trying to educate people that, you know, yes, we are having these great agreements, but that doesn't mean our people are well. We, people can have jobs and all that other stuff, but Indigenous communities, just because I have 99% employment rate, that doesn't mean my community is just like, you know, everybody's just so healthy and well. We still struggle with all the social issues that we did in the, in the early, the times before the actual industry came into community. So, you know, it's such a difficult conversation, and that's what we're really trying to communicate is that, the aquaculture industry has saved my community, um, and even more so, 
and has brought us to a place of a, a, at least prosperity at a basic level. But <clears throat> I think there's a way that this can really grow and continue prospering and, and bringing a, a good point for our community. But we still deal with the rhetoric of these activists who don't echo these or don't want to listen to these, these facts when it comes down to what it's like being in an Indigenous community at, at all. And so obviously uh, it's a real struggle because uh, we want to do business in a good way. They can do whatever they want, basically, but yet we're still accountable. We still have to represent our community in a good and proactive way. No, it's so, so true. And I mean, let, let's put this discussion around aquaculture. And I think everything we've been talking about today is so applicable across the spectrum of resource management, not just resource development, but resource management. But let's let's put this into perspective of the aquaculture discussion for a minute. Dave, who, who's your biggest who's who's your biggest customers right now? Or traditionally, who have your biggest customers been? Yeah, when I when I do have access to market, you know, 80% of our fish uh, stays within North America, 80-85%. Um, I supply retailers in the northeastern part of uh, the United States, California, uh, the eastern part of, uh, of Canada. Uh, those will be our largest uh, suppliers, or uh, pardon me, customers. Um, you know, and with the industry, it has its ebbs and flows with demand and supply. But overall, I mean, outside of this bubble we live in here on the, you know, inside of Vancouver Island, lower mainland uh, of the BC coast that, you know, the product is in high demand. Um, you know, people are asking, why can't I buy your fish? We think what you do is great. Why are you having all these problems with government? Don't they understand what you do? <laughs> uh, and, and sometimes the answers I have to re remember, like, I, this is what's actually happening. And it's, it's, it's a hard one to sort of continue to talk about, quite frankly, because it's just it gets a little old after a while, right? <laughs> Um, and so I just case in point, you know, these recent decisions and uh, despite our best efforts working with uh, Chief Roberts and trying to reintroduce some of the fish in the Discovery Islands, you know, I haven't sold a fish uh, into the market for, for over six and a half months now. And I'm still about a month and a half away from doing that. And to that point, I mean, the value we're trying to bring, the, the, the agreements we have, you know, they're all funded from from within the Canadian operation. Um, well, we try to anyway. We we generate our own revenue and then we invest back into the business. So, you know, we think about trying to do things better in the ocean environment. That takes a lot of money, and that money usually comes from selling fish. And so, when you're not selling fish, you're not generating the cash to reinvest into the business. Is there? Well, I think that's an interesting point right there, and that's something that I know Isaiah and I brought up many times over our last few trips to Ottawa, and I know you've accompanied us a few times, Dave. Um, you know, we're not talking blood diamonds here. We're talking something that's available in Loblaws, in Safeway, in Save on Foods. This is something that's in high demand because it's a good sustainable protein. And I've been quoted as saying, I would rather farm salmon for the general public so wild salmon can be saved for First Nations cultural and sustenance uses. And I've got no problem standing on that pillar because I'm also working with people like yourselves and, you know, Jennifer Woodland and Diane Morrison to help leverage opportunities from your business into actually helping, helping us enhance wild salmon opportunities within our territories. But for some reason, that's not good enough for the urban activists that are so well funded. I mean, I was in Ottawa last week and the billboards at the airport and the billboards at the bus stations, like, again, the billboard at a bus station beside a grocery store selling the product that they're saying shouldn't be done in British Columbia anymore. The irony is just, it's almost chokeable. It, it, it's almost really, if it didn't impact my community so much, I would be doing Saturday Night Live sketches about this. But I think the one thing that, you know, the general public or at least the urban activists don't realize is how much this means to our communities. There's 500 full-time jobs that exist in the aquaculture community in remote, 500 First Nations full-time jobs that exist in this industry. And we keep just talking about replacing it with something else. Well, I've been doing this for 25 years now, and you know the, the opportunities for replacing one major scale for something else to meet that same need 
just doesn't exist right now. And so you talked about transition. You talked about some of the technological advances that you're working at. I know on the East Coast, you've tried to introduce some technology. And, you know, as we introduce new things, you know, in theory, it's supposed to work out like this. But when you actually apply it in the territories, we need to learn something from that. So do you have any comment on just, you know, on CERMAX? introduction to new technologies and what it takes for you to to do that yeah for sure and maybe just like just back to the production piece and funding the tech you know it took 40 years for this industry to get to where it was and it took four years to take away 40 percent <laughs> uh and and that's sorry how sorry say, say that one say that one more time because i'm not very good at math but that sounds like pretty simple math in my head say that one more time please well, the size of the BC industry took 40 years to get to where it was before 2020. And in four years, 40% of what it took 40 years to accomplish is gone. Wow. And, Sorry, continue. And I, I say that about, you know, we have voluntarily left areas where um, relationships didn't work out, but uh, desperately trying to save what remains. You know, sitting here today, 100% of the farms that are left are under an agreement uh, with the nations. And so under that agreement, you know, in particular with us, you know, we, we sit down together and we, we listen, quite frankly, to what, what are the concerns and where are the opportunities to address those concerns through investment and innovation. And we all understand that protection of wild salmon, wild salmon is, is paramount. Um, we firmly believe that in ocean aquaculture done responsibly and progressively can coexist with wild salmon on the British Columbian coast. I think there's more than enough evidence to showcase that that's possible. And it should be something that in my mind should be built upon as opposed to be torn down. And that is where the decision lies between those two things. Either we build upon a good start on a transition plan or we tear it all down. And I don't know the reason for the latter, um, quite frankly. So we focused, you know, the, you know, relationship with the house it, they came to us and said, we'd like you to focus on uh, sea lice. I said, okay. So as a multinational, I'm lucky because my brother and sisters who grow fish in Norway and Chile have continued continue to grow their volumes and provide you know, cash for the business that allows them to invest in research and development projects and invest in continually evolving evolution of industry and innovation that I can learn from and then pick and choose what I think will work best in Canadian waters. So that's what we've done. We've done that with investing over $40 million in mechanical delousing tools. We've invested in the first semi-closed cage outside of Norwegian waters. We've invested in barrier technology across all of our farms as our smoke go into the sea, into Fino, all to uh, you know, try to achieve standards that the housing nation have asked us to achieve. They have been gracious. They, we have been open in how long these things take, how much money it takes, and the support we need from them to uh, get the equipment or sites uh, amended in Canada done, and they've done that. So it's been a real great example in my mind of a partnership of a nation and a company sitting down together, talking it out, figuring out, okay, here's the list. This is the highest item on the list. We attack that first, then we move on to the next, the next, and the next. And, you know, despite all the outside uh, pressures and, and disruptions right now with this process, we've been able to do, I think, a very nice job in their territory to deliver the results they've asked to deliver to deliver and um you know our our performance in the area pertaining to sea lights is fantastic it, it it always has not been that way uh we had a period of a rough period of time where things were were really looking dire but you know we you know put our nose to the ground and put our heads together and and came up with a plan and we're delivering on it and so but that takes time it takes business certainty uh, and it takes the openness to, to work with each other to deliver on it. And right now, the, the, the big thing that's missing for me to invest even further in what we've started is the lack of uh, business certainty when it comes to the, to the transition process. Uh, right now, uh, it's terrifying for me to say this, but I, you know, I've got fish going to sea right now that uh, the licenses expire in 
70, 84 days or uh, sorry, uh, six months and uh, 24 days. So uh, it's um, it's it's really uh, chips are down. Um, but in that is uh, example, real life examples of a company wanting to transition. We were not afraid of the word. Uh, we were kind of already doing it um, before we were told to do it. And we'd like to continue to do it um, if uh, if allowed. You know, I, I think that's tremendous. And I mean, I'm not going to lie. It's not all softballs on res dog walkers. I, I was at a, an event yesterday where a story came up that sounded very familiar, but it came up in, in a modern, modern time context. And um, maybe just your, your input or your comment on, you know, the herring issue that's come up over the last little while. Um, I know you and I talked about this last year and I know I talked to a Shechemist and, you know, he, he said that, you know, it was a challenging time. We asked them to do something. They did it. And there were some complications with that, that we've ironed out. Um, so maybe just without going into to too much detail, why don't you give me a few thoughts on just the challenges of innovation and, and herring specifically? Yeah. Thanks for raising it because it is uh, top of mind. <laughs> yeah. No, it's okay. It's all good. And these are all numbers that are transparently reported yes. through uh, federal portals or sharing with our nations. And, and, and that's not an issue. I mean, that's how you get better. It's unfortunate the way the numbers are sometimes used, which mm. prevent people continuing to do that. That's the issue. It's, it's how the information is used to Isaiah's earlier comment. Um, yeah. And so we changed the way we managed uh, our lice uh, on the fish and the, uh, in, in the farms in, in a house of territory and that required an investment in technology. Um, we used to use like in feed uh, for treatments, but now it's uh, mechanical seawater uh, delousing, which uh, washes the, the lice off the fish. We capture all the lice and dispose of them on land. Uh, we started uh, delivering that equipment to Canadian waters in the late part of 2020. Uh, the equipment uh, has been modified several times since then. And one of the modifications that has taken place is centered around bycatch management. Um, we have, um, happy to say, looks to be significantly increasing populations of herring on the west coast of British Columbia again and Vancouver Island, which is great to see. Um, and these, these fish do like to hang around our farms. Um, they provide natural cover for these herring from other predators, such as uh, salmon and seals and sea lions and whatnot. And, uh, by which the method these fish are, are sucked into this machine to uh, remove the lice we had in 2022, I'll call it a significant increase in, in bycatch mortality directly related to those fish going, those herring going through the delousing tools. Definitely not something we want to see and something we take very seriously. And we, we definitely didn't see it before and we needed to figure out why it was happening quite quickly. And so we were asked for information on these numbers that we had reported to DFO over a year and a half ago and had been sort of talked about about 12 months ago. And we, we sent the information across and the information we sent across was about us imply, you know, implementing a technology, learning how to use that technology in, in a proper way and then in a better way and changes we've made. And then happy to say that Yes, the unfortunate spike in 2022 is something we definitely didn't want to see. So we worked hard uh, to reduce it as quickly as possible. We put a bycatch working group together. We invested capital in different uh, barrier technologies to try to prevent herring from hanging around the farms. We implemented changes in the way the machine operated. And in 2023, which is, you know, three and a half weeks away from being uh, completed, we are really happy to see that the numbers have actually decreased back down to historical levels, which is 95% lower than the number we saw in 2022. And we thought there's an example of a farmer learning to use innovation to solve a problem inadvertently unbeknownst to them creates another issue, but Hey, it's a problem. So we fix it and we move on. There'll be another one. We'll fix it and we'll move on. That's kind of how life goes. Unfortunately, um, the way the information we provided was used, it, it made it seem like the world stopped in 2022. There was no talk of any improvement that had happened in 2023 and made it seem like we were very sort of irresponsible and quite frankly, you know, flippant in, in managing the situation, which is, is quite untrue. But again, back to my earlier comments about hard to find a balanced story. Um, 
And yeah, they reached out to some groups that are not our fans for in-depth comments on their expertise in this area uh, for their newscasts uh, before they even came back to us with any other questions, which, you know, how is a person meant to manage that? Uh, and so that was unfortunate. It, it, it doesn't stop our company's drive and desire to innovate. Um, we do have actually further opportunities to improve on the improved results in 2023. However, we, that requires capital. And at the moment, that capital isn't being spent because of the, the uncertainty uh, uh, from the uh, transition process and the, and the licenses that are pending uh, or up for renewal here soon. So, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's, you know, a classic example of, you know, again, one-sided story being told, it's never black and white. It's never that uh, succinct, especially when it comes to these sort of complex issues when it's about farming an animal. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get to a place where messages are being delivered and, well, listened to in a more constructive manner. No, I think I think that's I mean that's part of the transition process that we talked about. You talked about the forty percent reduction <laughs> in four months um, based upon forty years, but you know really forty years in the scope of resource development in British Columbia is really small. If you think about how far this industry has gone, that's one of the reasons why I'm here advocating for it today. I mean, you know, I've, I've spent my career around managing and protecting resources and understanding the importance of this industry in some of our communities but also seeing how willing the industry has been to evolve has been one of the reasons why leaders like isaiah and myself and the other half a dozen chiefs we had with us in ottawa last week you know advocating for this opportunity to to continue isaiah you were recently in scotland um you know tell me what you were doing there and what you were looking at i mean i know you probably had a couple nice single malts and you had a good visit with some people out there but um, what did you see that that that's of interest as you came home? Yeah, well, so we toured Scotland basically to do some modernization and innovation discussions and planning, really. And so, um, you know, it was really interesting to 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 see what my our partners at Moe Canada or West and their counterparts in Moe Scotland are actually doing, and of course, some of the comparisons and how uh, massive some of their facilities are and how far you can actually get with good investments. It was it was crazy, a 2,000 person processing plant. And that's because they're getting what they want over there. And so it's really interesting to obviously, uh, you know what Dave's talking about with the overall investment part. If, if industry gets enough runway, there's a lot that can be done. And it's quite in, impressive in that regard. But when it comes down to, you know, the, the bigger, the, the meat of the actual visit was actually the innovation modernization modernization was fun it was good but my the mean of it that was actually quite interesting is actually talking to the regulators talking to these other associations that are third party that you know sometimes in canada we don't get along with me for example um you know some of the private or sort of more so um or angler fishing association type situations the sports fishery type situations right and so having those discussions with them we asked them some candid conversations as conservationists would ask right and so we asked for example if we were to remove the farms today would it change the impact of the overall declining atlantic stock oh wow what a surprise too there there's a declining atlantic stock or declining fishery on that side of the world too and they basically said no it wouldn't change anything and so we got more and more into these discussions and they pulled a map out and showed us where the farms were it was really interesting. It's, it's an interesting case study, actually, in the sense of the left side of Scotland has all the farms, everything. There's no no farms on the right side of Scotland. So there's there's no interaction, period. But yet, like I said earlier, what a surprise, the overall decline of that Atlantic salmon stock is still so prevalent. And, and yet there isn't any connection. You know, the SEPA and, and these other groups are, have been having dialogue with Canada too on this, but it's interesting that it's not translating either when it comes to that high level discussion within the bureaucracy of Canada too, because I was quite interested to hear that they have connections in that regard too. So, you know, the overall trip was really good. I learned a lot. I think what was very, very beneficial to us was to have these discussions with these other groups because, you know, 
we have them in Canada and you know it's hard to get a good answer out of them but when we have it with these other third parties that um, that have a vested interest that are working with industry hand in hand that was that was really really cool to hear that the you know government is is getting a good amount of investment from the actual industry because they want to know how to get their fish to grow better they want to know how to do this better and so that progressiveness is so important and it's very very impressive to hear you know how everyone can work together surprisingly and get an initiative done as you get actually the real truth of the science done in an effective way so you know it, it's it's amazing as we dig more into this issue how more socially acceptable it should be but yet we still find ourselves in a problem dave just alluded to the fact that we're just wrapping up the transition process stage but these licenses expire, you know, in June of 2024. But the activists have been so successful at creating this divide between First Nations communities. You know, one of the problems we we, we faced as we started this, this effort to try renew salmon farms in the territories that they were wanted and accepted in was this whole First Nation versus First Nation thing that was really pumped up by the activists. You know, I keep reading about these 120 person petition, 120 nation petitions that want to see salmon farming no longer done on the coast of British Columbia. You know, uh, 95, 100 of those nations come from the Fraser River in the interior where there is no salmon farming in those territories. And so at some point we have to hit a place in the dialogue. And I've heard someone refer to it as the grown-ups need to sit down and have a real discussion about what are the impacts to wild salmon. There are obviously some because wild salmon has been in decline since the 60s. I was fortunate enough that my grandmother forbid my uncles, who were both highliners, from hiring me beyond the school time. So I would go commercial fishing from the end of June and I would get fired every Labor Day. So I didn't get to go herring. I didn't get to go dog salmon fishing, which is when you made a lot of your money. You kind of made, you made your sort of, you made your season throughout the summer, but then you made the extra during dog salmon and during herring. And I got fired every Labor Day. And I was always wondering, why are you firing me? I thought I was a good worker. You were telling me how, you know, how proud you were of my growth on the boat. And then finally, after my grandmother died, my uncle pulled me aside and he says, you know, your granny saw this industry in decline. She saw her husband and her sons fight tooth and nail to keep a living for their families while it was still getting further taken away. And so I was kind of one of the first in our family, which was a large family, to be sort of said, you know what, you're not going to be a fisherman anymore. That is not going to be the future for you. So wild salmon has been something that has been important to me for a while. But for some reason in this part of the discussion around aquaculture, this is the smoking gun. You know, according to, again, Vancouver urbanists and Victoria urbanists, this is the reason why wild salmon are in decline. But if someone wants to have a real discussion about wild salmon, I think the nations that we work with, Isaiah, have proven that they're ready to have that dialogue. For some reason, you can buy into TMX. No one has concerns about wild salmon impacts. I know nations at the mouth of the Fraser River have supported a $2.1 billion LNG facility. But for some reason, they're given the latitude to not talk about the impacts of wild salmon. I was at an event yesterday with the Premier, and we went past Senequa, the new housing development between Muscombe, Squamish, and Salatooth. Um, you know, we're adding 8,000 units that are going to have sewage going into the Georgia Strait. We've trusted them as nations to make decisions that take all these issues into consideration. You go farther up the Fraser River where there's habitat issues, where there's water management issues. But for some reason, this sector isn't given that benefit of the doubt. And so, you know, Isaiah, I, I, know, I know the answer to this question, but, you know, are, are you willing to sit down and take this to a nation-to-nation -nation level so we can have this discussion? We'll leave our industry partners at the door and you leave your environmental activists at the door. And let's go back to what we did traditionally. British Columbia has 203 First Nations in it. It has dozens of different languages. If we all thought from the same process, we would all speak one language. 
So we've always respected that autonomy, except for when it comes to salmon aquaculture. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Dallas. I, I think, um, you know, having these nation to nation discussions is so critical. And for them to understand that we have high expectations of them to do this and to do their business in an effective manner to protect the overall territories that they um, that they're working in. And, and you know, as these quote unquote shared assets go through too. you know, when it comes down to it, it's really important that we have these discussions because, you know, we're we're trying to survive. They're also trying to survive. But, you know, they don't see the picture that we have to see on these coastal communities of BC. They don't have, like for my community, we don't have pavement. We, it takes a very long time to get anywhere. And so, you know, these jobs that are being provided, this, this overall economy that's, that has been created, uh, you know, it's, it, it's not possible. And you've said this earlier, that we can't just plop something down there and hope it works. And so I think having these discussions and really explain to them that, you know, that we're in a place of, trying to do business and we've always been you know for kid for example that has been doing this for 20 plus years i can show this show them the overall model we use this is recognized world renownedly that has has set a good and has set a good solid precedence across the overall industry so you know we work in regards to a strong proactive intent not just for now and it's not even just for tomorrow it's for seven generations that's always really been the goal is to keep this territory protected and managed effectively from, from here on out. It says, and that's how our, our ancestors have always operated too. So, you know, th this is all coming to a head over the next little while. And I mean, I didn't invite Dave on the show today to keep kicking him while he's down. I mean, we understand that, you know, we talked about the first Discovery Islands process where it went through a judicial review and Minister Bernadette Jordan's decision got, got, turned over and they demanded that Joyce Murray redo the process. And, you know, while that process had a little bit more notes taken into it, it was still unfair. And this time the nations took the Discovery Islands process um, for litigation and judicial review. But as these things are all coming to a head and June 2024 is coming, Dave, what are you looking for, you know, as a path forward? Yeah, that's pretty much the elephant in the room, isn't it? I mean, for us and the business model that we have and how long it takes for us to get a fish to market, which is seven years, when you factor in, you know, where we grow the parents of the fish who are the smolt in our hatcheries, who are sent to the ocean pens on our farms uh, that are then sent to, to market. It's the license certainty. Nothing, you know, hashtag licenses matter. Um, they do. Uh, there's, there, there, there's, there's really, quite frankly, nothing more important um, because without the license certainty, everything else that we aspire to either continue to do or wish to do, depending on which geographical area you're referring to, it's obsolete. Um, if you look at our operating companies in CERMAC in Chile, historically, the licenses were granted for, uh, for life. Uh, now they've cut that back to 25 years. Um, and uh, in Norway, it's it's for life. And and here I am um, coming off uh, nearly a you know, a two year extension with no certainty at that two year announcement. And now I'm just a few short months away from an unknown again. And in order to make smart decisions on what to do from both a financial and biological point of view, I need the understanding of what the future looks like to some degree. Um, I need to understand, should I spawn fish tomorrow, Dallas, to put into a hatchery next week that would be available to go to a net pen in February of 2025? And right now, I have no idea. I'm literally the definition of a wing and a prayer right now. Um, I'm making decisions in good faith that the hard work of these fine gentlemen on this screen, others who are... Uh, all in this together to see that this industry has a long future on the coast of British Columbia are listened to and are acknowledged and the rights of the nations we work with are acknowledged and we're able to work together. Ten years ago, if I thought I'd be doing a podcast, well, I'd be like, what's a podcast? But then I'd say, if I was a salmon farmer in British Columbia 
that had agreements with nations who were wanting me to farm fish in their territory at standards that were setting in a collaborative and progressive manner and the government was saying no i thought you would have had one too many of those single malts that isaiah had in scotland um, but this is where we are. This is the reality of the situation. So sometimes I use humor to get through the days right now because it's, it's not fun. It's not fun. It's a dark cloud that's been hanging over our heads now since the uh, mandate letter came out in 2019. That's almost, that's four years ago now, um, pretty much to the day. Yeah, you're also a Giants fan, but we'll get into that on, on another episode or another discussion. But you know, I, I want to assure you that, you know, there's First Nations who understand the importance of this to their communities. And that's a starting point that's given us some significant momentum. So, Isaiah, where, where do you see this discussion going as we're starting to as we're starting to come to, you know, the negotiation, the push, the jockeying for position? What would you like to see going forward? It's quite interesting. So I'm a man of logic. But at this point, I have lots of faith and hope, which is, you know, you know, everything we've been doing in Dallas the last two and a half, three years of this overall, I've actually been doing this since 2020. And so just before COVID, I went to my first engagement with the Minister Bernard and Jordan. So, you know, it's been a long, long trek. Um, obviously, there's been really bumpy roads for my, my our counterparts at these, in these companies, our partners. And so I have hope and faith that the work we're doing will be heard. You know, we, the amount of work we're doing on science, the amount of work we're doing to accomplish, to do these things that the government of Canada has set precedence for at these large scale world, you know, conferences yet are struggling. And we're the ones that are actually pushing the envelope and getting the government of Canada these good gotcha points. You know, I have faith that we're doing a good job. And I have faith that we have a great opportunity to with this industry. And I really hope we're able to move forward together effectively because we're doing such good work along the coastal, along our coastal communities. And so it, it'd be a real, real shame. And, and I've talked about this previously. And, uh, you know, I'm not here to manage poverty. You know, when it comes down to my, my, our leaders have really, really done their best. We've more, we've gone more farther and above than the breadwinner of every, and in every household in my community. And so for us to be pulled back from that would be a complete detriment and, and managing poverty for, to me would be probably the saddest time of, of my elected term. So I have faith in what we're doing and I really, really hope um, for the best in, all, in, in every aspect. Well, thank you so much. And you know, that's really what it comes down to. As I've said, you know, throughout this, throughout this session is this isn't just about aquaculture. This is about First Nations finding their rightful role in their self-determination and getting, you know, urbanists and activists and everybody else who thinks they have a say in our communities and territories to understand that our community, the, com the health of our community is just as important as the health of the ecology and the economy in our communities. And I think more leaders like yourself, Isaiah, working with partners in the industry, like CERMAC Canada is with, you know, a house it and some other nations. I think we're working really hard to find that balance. So I really want to thank you both. Isaiah, I look forward to you riding shotgun with me on future episodes of the Res Dog Walkers. And I just want to thank you for all tuning in to listen. And I want to remind everybody to not miss out on the 9th BC Indigenous Resource Opportunities Conference coming to Nanaimo in no, or sorry, in April 24th to 26th of 2024. Since the beginning of the conference series, many successful partnerships now exist that bring significant benefits to First Nations, resource developers, businesses, and all levels of government. BC IROC lays the foundation for the future partnerships and benefits of First Nations and the resource sector. Visit our website at www.bciroc.ca to learn more and look forward to future events of the Res Dog Walkers. Gaila Kasla. Yo, yo, hey, yo, yo, hey, yo.